Okay, let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 1. Matthew, chapter 1. In two weeks so far, we've gotten through 11 verses, which we should congratulate ourselves. We don't always move that quickly. <laughs> the last time I pointed out that Matthew's list of names in verse 8 omits the names of three kings who are recorded in the Old Testament, 2 Chronicles chapters 21 through 26. Verse 8 again. And Asa begat Josaphat, Josaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat Ozias. And I mentioned that spellings vary when you go from Hebrew, then into Greek, and then Greek into English. That's called transliterating. Um, so wish that shouldn't throw off the real student of the Bible. Matthew jumps from Joram, or Jehoram, to Ozias, Uzziah, bypassing three kings in the Old Testament record. Matthew is giving the messianic line from Abraham all the way down to Christ, specifically through King David and the tribe of Judah, based upon Jacob's prophecy in Genesis 49, that uh, a lawgiver would not depart from Judah until Shiloh come and um, judgment would be given to him. He would be the ruler over the people. So the king would come eventually from the tribe of Judah. The anointed Messiah would be king over Israel, and so it's essential that his genealogy be from the descent of the kings. And I said it would be difficult to simply describe why these three kings were removed from the list as Matthew records it. Uh, so I decided, and I spent a couple of days trying to draw a chart that might illustrate it, and hopefully it'll help. So here it is. Any crooked lines are my fault. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 8. The names listed as you find them in the scriptures run, and I use the Old Testament spellings for simplification today. Went from Asa to Jehoshaphat, then his son Jehoram, and then his son Ahaziah, his son Joash, his son Amaziah, and then his son Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and so forth. But Matthew skips these three, so I singled them out of the list here. There were two kingdoms. The tribes were divided into two kingdoms after Solomon's son Rehoboam. Rather than lowering the taxes for the people, he decided he'd raise the taxes. And Jeroboam, who is said to be the son of Nebat, rallied the tribes to the northern part of the country and separated themselves into an entirely different kingdom known as the kingdom of Israel versus the kingdom of Judah. And sometimes those you think, well, Jews are Jews, aren't they? Yes and no. But the kingdom of Israel to the north was not authorized by God. They set up their own priests, they set up their own worship, they set up their own altars, and they made priests to offer sacrifices of the, the lowest of the people, the scriptures say. Now, let me see if I can't point out what's going on here, and it'll be just as clear as mud by the time we're finished. King Asa... Well, in the kingdom of Israel, the Bible talks about Omri, who was one of the kings of Israel, not from the tribe of Judah, just someone who became king, probably through warfare. He, the Bible records he had two children, a daughter named Athaliah and a son, Ahab. You've heard of Ahab and Jezebel. I always thought of Ahab and Jezebel when Bill and Hillary were in office. I don't know why that... <laughs> Ahab has a daughter named Athaliah, named undoubtedly after her aunt. That's not uncommon. That happens all the time. In the kingdom of Judah, Jehoshaphat has a son named Jehoram, but Jehoram takes the daughter of Ahab to be his wife, according to 2 Kings 8, verse 18. So you have two kingdoms mixed here, and undoubtedly two bloodlines. And between the two of them, they have a daughter named Jehoshaphat. I circled her name in blue and a couple of others who are relevant to the story as it unfolds. Jehoram also had a son 
Amaziah. But that son was not with his wife. It was with her aunt, Athaliah. She must have been a looker still. And she had her eyes set on her niece's husband, Jehoram. And according to the text, 2 Kings 8, verse 26, she was the mother of Amaziah. So that makes Amaziah only 50% from the tribe of Judah. The other 50% of his genetics would have come from some other tribe. Uh, Amaziah has a son from a, a woman named Zibiah, Zibiah of Beersheba. Back in Genesis, Abraham made a covenant with the king of Gerar in the land of Beersheba uh, that we won't invade your land, you don't invade our land, we'll live in peace with each other. That was essentially what it came down to. So she was from the southern end of, of the land of Israel, but she wasn't among the Jews. So Amaziah, who was 50% from the tribe of Judah, or uh, marries a, or has a, father, has a child with a woman who is not of Israel at all. That means his son Joash was only 25% now, the bloodline of Judah. And it was from the tribe of Judah the kings would come. Jo um, when Joash was barely one year old, God sent a, pre a prophet to a man named Jehu. Jehu was a captain of the army of the kingdom of Israel. And he, he said, I have an errand. He said, who's it for? He said, it's for you. They go inside and the prophet anoints Jehu with oil over his head and said, God has sent me to anoint you king over the kingdom of Israel. And your first job is to slay all of Ahab's family and install yourself as the king. So in all that slaughter, he ends up slaying Amaziah, who is half Judah, half something else. And uh, out of rage, this woman, his mother, Athaliah, so enraged, if my son can't reign over the kingdom of Judah, then nobody can. So she sets out to destroy all of Amaziah's kin. Uh, he has other brothers and sisters, and anyone in the family of Judah or who would pretend to claim the throne one day. He has a son named Joash. Joash is just a little guy. One year old. His step-aunt, or step-great-aunt, Jehoshaphat, sees all this going on, and she secrets Joash away safely, so he's, he's spared all the slaughter this Athaliah has going on. And then for the next six years, she presumes to reign over the kingdom of Judah. Of course, she didn't belong there to start with. When he's seven years old, Jehoiada, who was a Levite priest, says enough of this. He rallies all the Levites together, passes out weapons and swords, and says, let's go install the right king. So they, they go and they bring Joash to the capital, seven years old, and they make him the king of Judah, and they murder uh, Athaliah in the process, and wipe out her ambitions. So now there's a a king, once again, from the lineage of Judah, on the throne. At seven years old, he was the king, undoubtedly being coached by nurses and uh, grown-ups at the time. But he's still only 25% uh, from the bloodline of Judah. Joash, undoubtedly, to secure his rights to the throne and uh, court uh, respect of the nation of Judah, or the kingdom of Judah, marries a woman named Jehoadan of Jerusalem, according to 2 Chronicles chapter 25. She's 100% from the Judah. He's 25%, making his son now 75% from the tribe of Judah, or three-fourths of the Judah bloodline. And Amaziah, three-fourths of the bloodline, uh, marries a woman named uh, uh, Jecoliah, also of Jerusalem, 2 Chronicles 26. She's also fully... Uh, tribe of Judah, fully Jewish, or is a uh, kingdom of Judah. And God says, that's enough. 
So the line picks up with Uzziah. And the Bible says in a couple of places that the sins of the fathers, which would have been Jehoram, shall be visited under the children under the third and fourth generations. So we have three generations not included in the lineage of the Messiah when Matthew sets down to write. Then he picks up the lineage from uh, Jehoram to Uzziah. And we mentioned on our first lesson that a son is not necessarily an immediate son. It can be a descendant, someone who's the son of so-and-so, even though so-and-so was his great-great-grandfather. He's said to be a son of that person by descent. And Jotham, uh, Ahaz, Hezekiah, Manasseh, and so forth. That's what was going on. Talk about days of our lives and the young and the restless and uh, general hospital. I mean, they haven't got the Bible beat. The, the intrigue and the murder and the treachery and the adultery and the secret affairs and the backstabbing and the literal backstabbing with, with knives and so forth, it all originated the Bible. Some of the best story plots Hollywood ever hit upon were found originally in the Word of God. Now, let's read verses uh, 12 through 16. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel, and Salathiel begat Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel begat Abiud, and Abiud begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Sadok, and Sadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliad, and Eliad begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Mathan, Mathan begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. At this point, verses 12 and 13, the Messianic line begins to become obscure. And uh, the line from Jeconias to Zerubbabel, well, here, that leads me to chart number two. And once again, if the lines are crooked, it's because uh, my handwriting was crooked when I did it. The lines from Zerubbabel uh, to Eliakim are fairly uh, plain in the scriptures. Uh, let me make sure I get my notes. I don't want to miss anything here. Or Jeconiah to Zerubbabel are plain. First Chronicles 3, verse 17. Beyond that, the Holy Spirit for reasons of his own, nearly obliterates the trail of descendants. We can trace the names through the captivity uh, into Babylon and from Babylon, but the official roster of those who should have or could have been king after that uh, is difficult to nail down in the Old Testament. Uh, verses 14 through 16, well, yeah, verses 14 to 16, once again. And Zerubbabel begat Abiad, and Abiad begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor, and Azor begat Sadok. Sadok begat Achim, and Achim begat Eliad, and Eliad begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat Mathan, and Mathan begat Jacob. Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. After Zerubbabel, the names differ so much that it's a mystery. This is the list of names as you'll find them in the Old Testament. In 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 3, I believe. This is the names, the list of names as they're found in Matthew's record. After the great um, library of Alexandria, Egypt burned about 48 BC, it was the Google of its day. It tried to keep records on the entire world, the known world at the time. And Julius Caesar is said to have been responsible for the burning down of the library storehouse in Alexandria, Egypt, of the ancient world. After that library was burned down, the official records of the Jewish descendancy to the throne of David uh, were lost. And no rabbi today 
can show the record of kings after Zedekiah was born in Babylon. Now, Luke chapter 3 records Mary's ancestry back to King David. Matthew records Joseph's ancestry. Without trusting these records, no Jew could ever put a rightful king of Judah on the throne again. Now I want to run through a few famous name changes. There's a singer, Catherine Hudson, who changed her name to Katy Perry. Some of you have heard of that little bimbo. Katy Perry's parents were both Pentecostal preachers. So I have some reason to believe she was exposed to the gospel as a young kid. For all we know, she might have even gotten saved. But she certainly walked away from that when she became a Hollywood slut. <laughs> Reginald Kenneth Dwight changed his name to Elton John. Marion Morrison became John Wayne, the Duke. Carol Wojtyla was known to the world as Pope John Paul II. All popes changed their names upon uh, election to the papacy. Nick Coppola became Nicolas Cage. Uh, Tony Big Tuna Akato was a mafia boss. The mafioso have some great nicknames for themselves. A man named Eric Bishop changed his name to Jamie Foxx, the entertainer. Anthony Roncalli became John, Pope John XXIII back in the 1960s. Karen Johnson is better known to the world as anyone know. Whoopi Goldberg. Karen Johnson is Whoopi Goldberg. And then there's uh, Israel Alderman, who was known as Ice Pick Willie, another mafioso name. Also, we have Carmine Charlie Wagon's Fatico, another mobster. Philip the Chicken Man, Testa. Don't ask me where the names originate or why they had them. Just know that they're there. In fact, you might not want to find out. They might have to demonstrate something to you and you wouldn't want to be. Thomas the Toupee Bilotti. I'd like to have that one. There was Charles the Typewriter Nicoletti, Francis Cadillac Frank Salema, and of course we all have heard of John Teflon Don Gotti. And I'm not trying to make fun of the name changes, only to show that as improbable as it may seem, it's not impossible that the list of names in the book of First Chronicles are also the same ones mentioned in Matthew's list. Like I say, it's rather improbable, but it's not in an impossibility. People are changing their names all the time for one reason or another. Let me put this down for a moment. Do that over there. Let's read verse 16 again. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. The way the Holy Spirit has worded the text, it's obvious that Joseph was not the father of Jesus Christ. But just like he worded it in Luke chapter 2, verse 33. Run over to Luke chapter 2, verse 33, when they brought the baby Jesus to be dedicated. Luke 2.33 says, And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him, Christ. Nearly all the modern translations say his father and mother marveled, thus making Joseph Christ's father by that change. And uh, that not only undermines the virgin birth, it also undermines the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ by changing one word. The Holy Spirit, who inspired every word of the Bible, certainly knew who Christ's father was. In a sense, he was Christ's father. Look at verse 20 in our text. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, 
Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. The words Jesus, who is called Christ, are worth noting. Uh, one is the human name, the other is his title, Christ, which means the Anointed One. Since Satan is also called, uh, or said to be anointed, Ezekiel 28, verse 14. Thou art that anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. The Holy Spirit is careful to point out that there is more than one Christ in the Word of God. Recall Matthew 24, verse 24, Jesus prophesied, For there shall uh, come, arise false Christs and false prophets, and so forth. Luke chapter 2, verse 26. And it was revealed unto him, Simeon, by the Holy Ghost, that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Acts chapter 4, verse 26. The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Or to cite the original from Psalm 2, verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. The use of the word Christ rather than the name Jesus is a key to much of the apostasy in modern Christianity, and I suppose uh, aided by many of the new Bible translations. Um, it's at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11. Satan is a Christ, but he's not the Lord's Christ. In fact, he will be known for mimicking and imitating and trying to be such a um, copy of the Lord Jesus Christ, so much so that uh, he would deceive multitudes around the world. He will, and this is why I've often thought, one of the glorious things the Lord Jesus has is the bride of Christ, which comprises all believers throughout the world. No matter where they are from, no matter what color of their skin, no matter what language they speak, if they have trusted the saving power of Jesus Christ by his blood shed for their sins, they can be born again and part of the body of Jesus Christ, part of the bride of Jesus Christ. And so Satan is busy. We're reminded over and over again by the Apostle Paul that uh, he is your enemy. Peter says, your adversary, the devil walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And Paul warns us to put on the whole armor of God that you may withstand in the evil day. And so it's Satan's job to try and stop the spread of the gospel, to destroy the life and the work and the faith and the hope of Christians, the body of the bride of Jesus Christ. And yet the um, Antichrist, Daniel chapter 11, is described as a king who shall not regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. Maybe a homo. That's very seldom mentioned when you hear Bible preachers and prophecy teachers on the radio or on the internet. Very few of them will point out the fact that he's indicated to be a homo as well. A few years ago, Jerusalem suffered their first gay pride parade. The holiest city in God's, on God's earth had their first gay pride parade, and there, there's an article in Time magazine showed rabbis just weeping and, you know, tearing their shirts like someone had died. And uh, I said, I felt sorry for those, those uh, Jews who knew better and knew it was against the commands of God to watch this filth going through the streets of Jerusalem. And uh, the Bible says in the book of Revelation that the two witnesses' bodies will lie in the streets of that great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, wherein also our Lord was crucified. That will be the city of Jerusalem, likened to two of the most corrupt societies of the ancient world. 
The Lord Jesus prophesied, um, I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken, the other shall be left. Luke 17, 34. None of the modern Bibles say two men. They just say there'll be two in one bed without any prophetic revelation. Uh, that's also That also indicates that it is still a possibility, or rather it's still possible, for some Christian who has been born again, regenerated by the power of the Holy Spirit, he knows he's on his way to heaven now, to still engage in that and be caught off guard when the rapture takes place. One shall be taken, and the other shall be left. As vulgar as it is, as nauseating as it is for us uh, normal thinking people, that's nevertheless part of the world we live in. But the man of sin will try to mimic and match the Lord Jesus Christ in every way possible. He showeth great signs and wonders, Second Thessalonians 2 tells us. So he will seek to be worshipped as God, sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, the Bible says. And so this leads me, and I'm still looking for uh, scripture to confirm it, but my suspicion would be that the Antichrist won't be Donald Trump. It's not going to be, you know, Prince Harry or somebody from, it's going to be at least a 30-year-old man accepted by the United Nations as a young man with wisdom like we've never heard before. He's got the answers for the world's politics, the answers for the world's financial troubles, the answer for every other issue in life. And uh, he will mimic the Lord Jesus Christ so closely that uh, I expect him to be a young man about 30 years of age, just like Jesus was after his baptism by John, John chapter, or in Luke chapter uh, 3. So uh, Satan is a Christ, but he's not the Lord's Christ. That's the point I want to make today.